Hi, welcome back. We are working on finding the discrete time Fourier transform. And I have an example here. Find the Fourier transform of this rectangular pulse uh, given by this thing, where n1 is a parameter of the pulse. So let's first understand what that thing is telling us by plotting x. So when we'll start here at the origin, maybe we'll just plot just for plotting purposes, we'll choose a value, maybe n1 is equal to 2, but when we do the math, we won't assume that n1 is 2. We'll keep n1 and, and uh, use the parameter throughout the calculations. Anyway, when, when n is less than, or when n is equal to 0, 0 is less than or equal to 2, so we would have a 1 here. 1 is less than or equal to 2, but so is negative 1, right? The negative 1, the absolute value is 1. 1 is less than or equal to 2. Then 2, at 2, 2 is less than or equal to 2, and negative 2, the absolute value of that, is also less than or equal to 2. But now 3, 4, right, these are all going to be 0. And negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, the absolute value is, le is not less than or equal to 2. So those are all 0 as well. So this is the rectangular pulse that we're talking about. It alternates from 0 to 1. I guess it doesn't alternate, but it goes from 0 to 1, back to 0. Then it stays 0. And it's centered around the origin. And it has a pulse width of 2 times n1 plus 1, right? 5 in this case. All right. So we've got an idea of our signal that we're trying to find the Fourier transform of. Let's, let's go to it. Let's get to it. So we've got the analysis equation. E, uh, x is equal to minus infinity. N, n is minus infinity to infinity of x of n e to the minus j omega n. So we have to figure out what that sum is. Now, um, that's an infinite sum. However, the zeros contribute nothing to the sum. So I might as well sum from n equals minus n1, right? We're going to it's minus 2 in this case, but we're going to we're going to keep n1 throughout the calculation. So we're going to sum from minus n1 to positive n1. Okay? And in that range, the signal is 1. So I'm not even going to write that there. And then we have e to the minus j omega n. So this is the summation that we have to solve. So I would just ask that you, you know, maybe pause the video and decide for yourself how would you solve this sum if you were confronted with it. And really, you know, you only have two possibilities, <laughs> but um, it requires a little bit of manipulation. So you might want to think of that. And the answer is that you're either going to use the finite sum or the, the infinite sum formula. And because we're not, we don't have any infinities here, you, you have to use the finite sum formula. But you have to get it into a form that, um, so that we can apply the, the finite sum formula. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this into two sums. So I'm going to go from negative n1 to negative 1 of e to the minus j omega n. And then I'm going to add to that, then the other piece, n equals 0 to n1 of e to the minus j omega n. Now, I'll write out the infinite or the finite sum formula over here in blue, just to remind ourselves. OK, the finite sum formula says that n equals 0 to n of alpha to the n is equal to 1 minus alpha to the capital N plus 1 over 1 minus alpha. Okay, so you see the second term now. Now that I've broken it up, the second term is exactly in this form. So you can form fit it. right? You see what our alpha is. Our alpha is e to the minus j omega. Our n is n1. So we can immediately apply the formula to the second summation. So let's do that. So this becomes plus, then 1 minus e to the minus j omega to the upper bound plus 1. So the upper bound is n1 plus 1 over 1 minus alpha, 1 minus e to the minus j omega. So, okay, we've got that sum. Now, what are we going to do for this thing? Well, we only can use the finite sum formula. So we have to get 
this sum into that form. And so this thing goes from zero to some upper bound. So the first thing I might want to do is try to switch the bounds. So to bring the one down to the lower bound. So what, what I'm going to do is use a change in variables. Change in variables, which is a technique that we've used quite a bit in our course. And I'm going to let some you know, some other variable, call it n hat, equal minus n. And so, now my sum would become, well, when n is minus n1, n hat is plus n1, and when n is minus 1, n hat is plus 1, e to the plus j omega n hat, right? Because when, again, we're, we're substituting n hat for n, so that makes a minus there, and that cancels with that minus. And then I still have this thing. Now, another strategy for handling the summations that we've seen is that you can change the order of the bounds in summations. You can, you know, so you can add 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth, or you can do 1 eighth plus 1 fourth plus 1 half plus 1. The order of summation doesn't matter. So we can go n hat equals 1 to n1, and that doesn't change anything with the summation. Okay. So this is, you know, this is just all math for right now. You had this in calculus. All right, now we, we compare this thing, this summation that we're trying to solve, with our finite sum formula. We're almost there. It's just that the lower bound is 1 instead of 0. So can we make the lower bound 0? And you can. You, you, can, you can make that 0. Except, if you're going to include the n equals 0 term in your sum, then you have to subtract it out, right? If you're going to include it in the sum, then it has to be subtracted out, or else you've changed the problem. So what is the n equals 0 term? e to the 0 is 1, so I have to subtract 1 if I added 1 in the sum. And then, of course, I still have this here. All right. Okay, so now we're in business. Now we can apply the finite sum formula to this thing, and this becomes 1 minus um, e to the minus j omega, uh, not minus, excuse me, e to the plus j omega n1 plus 1 over 1 minus e to the j omega minus 1 and then plus what we had, right? Now, observe the, the handling of the exponents, how we have this um, you know, plus j omega, and we have the minus j omega. What does that usually indicate? Yes, that we have a sine or a cosine. Now, I'm not going to show you the gory details here because this, this ends up being just algebra. I'm going to show you, I'm going to get you started, and I'm going to encourage you to try to find the result. But what you want to do here is get a common denominator. And so the common denominator the common denominator is the multiplication of those two denominators, right? And, and actually, when you factor that out, you, you, or when you FOIL it out, the e to the j omega times e to the minus j omega is equal to 1, so that's nice. But anyway, so what you would start doing is getting this common denominator, so we would, we would multiply the first fraction multiply the first fraction by 1 minus e to the minus j omega. And then the 1, we, would, we need both, fa both of those factors for the 1. Okay, and then for the next and last term, we need 
to multiply by 1 plus e, or excuse me, not 1 plus, 1 minus e to the positive j omega. And then we can put all of that over the common denominator, which is 1 minus e to the j omega times 1 minus e to the minus j omega. Okay, and so as I said, when you FOIL those that term out, you get 1, and you get uh, e to the minus j omega, and then e minus e to the plus j omega, so that would make a, a sine wave, and then you have e to the j omega times e to the minus j omega, which cancels and makes 1, e, e to the 0. And you do something similar in the numerator. Again, I encourage you to work this out, but don't spin your wheels trying to do it. The, the math is not important here. The algebra, this is algebra. And what you end up getting is the sine of omega times n1 plus 1 half over the sine of omega over 2. So that's the answer. All right. Now I would I would not expect you to be able to do this on your own without you know being told that this is the answer. So you really if you can get to I would expect you to be able to solve the summations. So if you can get to this, I'll I'll, I'll circle it in blue. If you could get to this, then you're in good shape. But anyway, don't try to don't spin your wheels getting there. Try it if if you like. But uh, this is this is the final answer. This is a nice. Um, convenient answer for us. And observe that the omegas come inside the sine wave and sine is periodic with period 2 pi. So um, if we plotted this then you would see that it is periodic with period 2 pi. It has to be because it's the Fourier transform of a discrete time signal. And so it has to be periodic with period 2 pi and it is. And it, it actually looks like a, a sinc function that's re that repeats. You should plot it. Choose a value of n1 and plot it. Um, it's also purely real, right? There are no j's hanging around in this expression. It's purely real, so it only takes one plot to, to plot it. And the reason it's real, and this is foreshadowing when we get to properties, the reason it's real is because this thing is even 